The reason we've had you waiting around so long this afternoon, which we apologise for, is the fact that they only actually released Nicky from Belmarsh Prison at about 11 o'clock this morning. Because you and some of your colleagues were there. Because you and some of your colleagues are camped outside his house. He's kind of feel, feeling a bit overwhelmed by it. Very of you who was up in the court yesterday, you would have known the pressure he was under at the point where the jury said, not guilty. He literally broke down. And he's still trying to recover from that emotionally today. So he's very reluctant to be here. And he's reluctantly agreed to come. Because we didn't want to waste your time. So we've sent someone to go and pick him up to try and ensure that he actually arrives. When he does arrive, we ask you, even though we know you want to get the photos and such, we ask you to take your time and show some restraint because he's overwhelmed. And we don't want him to be, we don't want him to go past that point. So we would ask that you um, cooperate with us and show a little bit of coolness. Some of us, those who are on the platform with you today, this is Winston Silcock and Mark Braithwaite. There are two of the Tottenham three. There are two of the Tottenham six. There are two that have been through the experience of the state just for Nicky Jacobs through. This is Nicky's solicitor, Tony Myself. Some of us who are sitting here today, these three brothers, will have a total understanding of what it is that Nicky Jacobs is going through. They'll have an understanding because they've been through it. They went a little bit further than Nicky went. They'll have an understanding because they know what it's like to sit in the old baby, court number two, that's where that child started, and be accused of a policeman's murder. Especially when it's in the middle of a media frenzy. This time around, we didn't see the media frenzy. And we're a bit disappointed in that. You see the media talking about the corruption that goes on within the Metropolitan Police Service. But it's not just about the corruption of the Metropolitan Police Service that my community needs to be afraid of. It's about the collusion of those that we would hope would hold the Metropolitan Police Service to account and constantly fail to do so. So when Nicky says he feels overwhelmed, he's not overwhelmed just because he knows that the police tried to carry out a legal lynching of him. It's because he knows that all the powers that be were involved in that process too. We're talking about the CPS and the DPP. The Can't Prosecute Service <laughs> manages to prosecute cases that it shouldn't prosecute. If they had been as zealous in prosecuting Detective Chief Superintendent Melvin and Detective Chief Inspector Dingle, the two police officers who quite clearly framed Winston Silcott in 1985 and who went to court for framing Winston Silcott in 1994, if the state had been as zealous and as keen to prosecute those people, in the way they were zealous and keen to prosecute Winston Silcott, Mark Braithwaite, Engin Ragged, Mark Pennant, Mark Lamby, and, and Jason Hill. <coughs> if the state had done that, then people like myself might have stood up and said to our community, what happened to Blake was terrible, and if you know who did it, you should help them. But if you're going to deal with us in an unjust, oppressive, illegal, and criminal manner, you can't come to us afterwards and talk about justice. There's a story here that too many of you in the media are not aware of, because this story spans 30 years. But the story is that the person who was Winston Silcox, QC, who failed to defend him, who didn't let him go into the witness box, who didn't provide a defence for him, then went on to become 
the Director of Public Prosecutions, <coughs> then was required and responsible for prosecuting the officers who had framed her quietly. You would have expected that she would have wanted to carry out a prosecution where all of the evidence was put on the table, where all of the facts were put on the table, because let us not forget the biggest case in the land. First time a police officer had been murdered in riots or an uprising in over a hundred years. And these guys got off because of the corruption of the officers who led the investigation. This country deserved to know what happened. And we had a court case in the O'Bailey that you all didn't really cover very well. Because the media didn't tell Britain that although Winston Silcott was released from the Royal Courts of Justice with an apology from the highest judge in the land, although the prosecutor who prosecuted that case, his name was Roy Amnott, top treasury counsel, he never prosecuted again because he was so tainted from being involved in such a corrupt investigation. And somehow, England doesn't know this story. And somehow, England doesn't know that those officers, that those officers went on trial in the old baby. And I told you who was heading that trial, Barbara Mills. And they chose not to call the victim. The state chose not to call Winston F. Silcott to give evidence as to how he was framed and how he ended up with a 30-year sentence. But not only did they choose not to call Winston Silcock, the police officers who committed the offence didn't go into the dock. So we had a trial in the Old Bailey Central Criminal Court in the land where none of the three people, and only these three people in a room when Winston Silcock was framed, none of them gave evidence. What they did instead was they took 14 tainted statements, 14 statements from the tainted investigation and they used them in the court to defend the police officer's right to frame somebody. Rose Levin, who gave evidence in the case against Nikki Jacobs, has now been proven to be a liar as the jury didn't accept his testimony. Rose Levin's statement was one of those 14 statements. Rose Levin had said to the police that Winston Silcott was there. But in the, in the Old Bailey, he accepted that Winston Silcott had never been there. We believe the other 13 statements of the police <coughs> were just as bent and corrupt as Rose Levin. And that somehow, somehow, the police have been allowed to frame somebody, the DPP and the CPS have come together colluding to protect the police and to allow the police officers who framed an innocent person to resign from the job on an enhanced pension. We believe that the moment that that happened, the state lost every right to ask us to help them to find justice. Because if we're not allowed to have justice, we don't believe anybody else is allowed to have justice. If there is no justice, there is no peace. And that's what we say in Tottenham. So today, Winston Silva and Mark Braveway, who normally don't speak publicly, who understand why Nikki feels so overwhelmed today because they have felt overwhelmed for a long time, but who felt that they had to come out and support him because they could see that the state was trying to do to him what he'd done to them. Today they're here to share a few words with you all. Words of support and sympathy for Nikki. I'll give you Mark Rayford. The situation is basically this. We... It was like a point of deja vu. Even though we was in the gallery, it felt like we was on trial again because regardless of this case moving to anybody else it still feels like you're on trial because the media in the sense of what they put across is still going to be from the original trial 
So whether you like it or not, you're still linked with it. We watched it from the gallery, well I watched it from the gallery, both of us, all of us at times at different times when we watched it. And it was sad at the point that there wasn't really any media there to really actually take down notes and to see what was basically going on. You know, it felt like the, from going from a case where there was media, it was like a circus when we was at, when we was convicting and when we was at trial back then, to come into a case where there was actually nobody at all there. It's like it felt like, and what it looked like is that nobody actually cared. You know, it's like if he would have been convicted, then basically it would have been a different story. But. Praise be to God, is that directly the jury actually saw through it and saw through it from an early stage of inside of the case. Do you know what I mean? That really doesn't say that anybody should be um, denied justice in any form. But when you reap justice, that is not justice. Yeah? Now, the jury, like here, <coughs> all the journalists who are here. <coughs> I would say to you, put your hands in your hearts, right? You all got a, a view of this case, but none of you have actually got a correct view of this case, yeah? Because you've never looked at it independently, yeah? And if you want to basically look at it independently, you have the transcripts what are here. You can look at the basically the transcripts are available to all of you, and I would suggest that all of you read it, and then basically see the testimonies of the witnesses. And then you can decide to yourself, like the jury, if it was credible. Because the concept is, we cannot keep on always going through, turning around and being stigmatised with this rubbish. You understand it? It's not right. Yeah? And you can't turn around and generation after generation coming with the same tainted view based upon a story which they don't actually know about. Yeah? I feel that in this case here, and I'm saying it to you, you lot need to read the, read the transcripts, read what was basically said, and then you can see, because the jury was made up of like independent people, all different groups of people. And I feel that what people need to really look at this, this is a very serious situation. And what it actually turns around and it tells you, it's not a small set of people, it means that general public do not believe the police no more. That's right. This is how, this is how, this is, this is where this case has actually brought it. They've actually brought it to their head, where the public, Joe public don't believe you no more. Yeah, and it's because at the end of the day, the way this case was put together, the way that the first case was put together. When I was watching this, when I was watching the case, there was something in it which turned around and came to my mind, and I have to mention it, and I'm not going to put it to one side. I was something which must have missed me when I was in a blur in the trial in 1985. I don't know if it was mentioned, but what it was mentioned in there, there was a, a report where they were talking about what the radio, what was on the radio, was correlating on the radio, what they were saying what was taking place. And they described what shocked me, which I never knew, they described the people who they were trying to get to as the enemy. And I said, that's funny, why would you call a person the enemy? You never refer to them as IC3, you never refer to them as black, you refer to them as the enemy. So, in the sense that we're not silly here, if you mention an enemy, you turn around and it seems of a, a team of a state of war. So now the people then who were basically participating then may have thought it was a riot, whereas in the sense the police believed that it was a war. So then if you look at it and you take it along, you say to yourself it's a war, then the, the suspects wasn't interviewed, they were interrogated. And then when the suspect says that they were actually ill-treated, that was basically the torture. So, in there, when you look at it and you carry it along and we fast forward it to now, you ask to yourself, in the mentality, if that was the mentality basically then, what has actually changed? And that's what the, that is where I'm saying to you, if that was the mentality then, then you're saying to yourself now, you're the basically as the media, you're saying to yourself, well, there is something's happened and it's wrong. But none of you have actually delved into it to actually see what is really going on. This wasn't basically an investigation. This was basically a witch hunt. It was created in a domino effect. Yeah. All you had to basically yeah. do was this. You had to get one person, 
You mentioned the one person, another person in his statement that gave you the right to go and arrest that person. He mentioned another name in it, he arrested another person. And it was a domino effect and it went all the way down. The methods were wrong. If you turn around and you could put hand on heart, which one of you would have liked your 14 year old child to be turned around and investigated and basically without his parents, without a legal guardian, without a solicitor, in a blanket, naked? And he wasn't black, he was white. I don't understand the slant of this case because it's always been put across as like it was this case was to do with black people. But it wasn't just to do with black people, it was a case that was had many different colours in it. But it's only it seems like we're expended, it's like we're expedient in the sense that we can use and say, well it's black people because we're the three percent of the country and we always turn around and pay for everybody else's crimes. Do you know what I mean? So, for me now, I'm turning around and I've looked at this case and I'm saying I looked at it without like partiality. I didn't turn around and say to myself whether I was determined whether the person was innocent or guilty. I looked upon it on the evidence. And the evidence stopped halfway through the case. And at the end of the day, if the media was there and the general public would have knew about this, outside of that, they would have been horrified. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to turn around and you're going to give uh, somebody millions Millions to turn around and carry out an investigation. You could have gave us 50 quid and we could have found your free crackheads. <laughs> there was a point in the court case when the state knew it was losing it. So to, to create the emotions that were similar to 1985, they played the recording of when the serial, the PC Blake of was part of, came under attack. And in playing the recording, what we heard was the police on several occasions and different officers talking about the enemy. And that was the perspective back in 1985. We weren't even the suspects. We were considered to be the enemy and we were treated, as, we were treated like that. But it wasn't just the police that did that. And what Mark is referring to, the things that we heard in the court, let us remember. Let us look at the witnesses that was put in front of this court. We had John Brown. John Brown was a young white guy at the time, still a white guy, so heroin addict, financial difficulties, told lots of lies, four years, four months in prison for a fray, his part in those riots. And what did John Brown tell those police officers? He said, I'm not being racist, but I can't tell one black face different from another. How could the CPS and how could the DPP then rely on him to be a witness. Because if you haven't noticed, <coughs> Jacobs happens to be black. Rhodes Levy, again, someone who they took for a witness. Someone who, whilst he was under their protection, was arrested in possession of 63 <coughs> wrapped out bags of Class A drugs. 63 wrapped out bags of Class A drugs, and they got him a 12 months um, community sentence for that. Right now, he's being caught again. He was also caught, whilst under witness protection and put in a safe house, he was caught stealing from other people who was under witness protection. How could the CPS and the DPP ask a jury to have any faith in anything that this guy said? And let me remind you finally what he said, when he didn't know that they were secretly recording him because they didn't trust him. He said that he, brought PC Blakelock down to the ground. So I know the question that you'll all love to ask at the end is if we know the murderers of Blakelock and if we know his murderers, will we tell the police? Well, we'll tell the police this today. You've been dealing with one of the murderers of Blakelock yeah, yeah. since 1985. Yeah, yeah, well and then, let's talk about the other witness called Q, who happened to be the cousin of the first witness called John Brown and totally denied it all the way through the court case, even though John Brown admitted to being the cousin. Q put the murder scene in the wrong location. The police interviewed him and pointed out the right location. And Q said, that might be how you see it, I can only tell you what I saw. How could the state, the CPS, the DPP, rely on such, I can't even call it, Weak evidence. There was no weak evidence. Why did the state put up three eyewitnesses that in Tottenham we call three lie witnesses, knowing that each of their accounts 
not only contradict, contradicted each other, but contradicted the facts as we know them. And before you answer the question, I'm going to hand over to Winston Silva, because Winston understands exactly what it feels like to be at the um, receiving end of this kind of treatment from the state. Well, I just want to give you a sort of gist um, of uh, what Nicky Jacobs is feeling at the moment. And uh, he's going to be feeling like Billy Files. And as we know it, obviously, he's going to be very stressed out and, 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 and overwhelmed by what's happened to him. And I don't know if you've been following, but as you heard, South Philly said they released him at 11, 11 o'clock uh, today from, uh, was it Bill Marsh? Yeah. Now, just put yourself in that brush, in these shoes, that you've been found innocent, you've been released from the court, and you're still in the prison cell. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? Mm -hmm. So, obviously, <coughs> my understanding, he's very stressed out, he obviously didn't sleep too well. But talking from my experience, back in the days, um, you, media, in that you had less restrictions, basically. You had the green light. And basically, I was called every name under the sun in some of the, some of the newspapers. And then going through the court trial, you just feel like everybody's against you. And only uh, people you're hanging on tight to is like your family and your friends who are there for you. And then you go into the court, everything, what's going to happen is surreal. You know the evidence is lies from beginning to this present day. Because what people fail to understand, basically, the day they went into um, Floyd Jarrett's mother's house, that's where it all started. Yeah. Some people would say it started the week before from Cherry, Cherry Gross. But like um, Mark was saying, <coughs> I don't think the media's done a, a proper job <laughs> on explaining the facts of what's been happening throughout this case or this journey. Like Saka said, basically, when I got framed by um, Dingle and Melvin, there's only three of us in um, Paddington Police Station uh, interrogation room. They done what they done, got caught out, and the only person other than them who's in the room ain't called to give evidence. Now, I found that totally strange. And then they rehash false evidence from back in the day, which a lot of it got disproved as false evidence because it came admitted from a 14 year old young man, it was Jason Hill at the time. Hence the so called, um, what they call it, <coughs> beheading of PC Blake. That's all false. But today, what should I say? Um, yesterday, it is still mentioned in the court. The, the, the criminal courts of justice, it was still mentioned about the beheading. And in, in 87, the judge said that was fantasy. And that's why Jason Hill got um, acquitted from the trial. So I can't understand how um, to, to today, the same rehashed evidence is going around and around and there's nobody sensible out there enough to understand, well, well I've heard this before, or even if you wasn't around in time, you haven't done your research, because something, something is totally wrong, unless it's, unless, how I look at it, some people choose to ignore the facts, and if they're choosing to ignore the facts, Fact, therefore they're colluding 
And if you're colluding, as far as I'm concerned, with the police all the time, and then you expect to come to people and ask people, well, who did kill PC Blake, so, and you want help, you ain't gonna get no help. You, you won't get no help. I mean, anybody, everybody can come down to ask me who killed Peter. I can tell you, I don't know. Because I wasn't there. Yeah? And to me, just thinking from a, a logical um, standpoint, I'm not involved, and somebody come and ask me, I, I, you, you don't know. Because there's many people there, they could have come from all walks of life, wherever they could have come from, Mars. <laughs> I'm being hypothetical, I'm being silly, but nobody knows where a lot of the people were like on the estate. Who was there? So to target just people from the estate and black people in general, it's totally wrong. It's, it's, it's totally wrong. The problem is, anyway, what are they going to do then, Yeah, that's me.